Welcome to Buddha the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people and discussions about spiritual topics and so on. Um, I've done hundreds of them now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com uh, where you will see, and look under the past interviews menu, and you'll see all the previous ones organized in various ways. This uh, program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. Uh, it's made freely available to everyone, but we do rely upon contributions by those who feel inclined to contribute. So if you're one of such people, then there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. Okay, um, my guest today is Leanne Whitney. Uh, I'll just read her bio here. Um, Leanne is a she has a PhD. She's an independent scholar in the fields of depth psychology and consciousness studies. She specializes in the intersection of Western psychology and the Eastern liberatory traditions. And by liberatory, we mean traditions which promote or allow or <laughs> encourage liberation. That's what the, that word means. For over 25 years, Leanne has researched the mind-body connection. And over the past last 15 plus years, their integration with pure consciousness. Trained in depth psychology, yoga, and cranial sacral therapy, in her private practice, Leanne works with clients one-on-one -on -one to resolve mental, emotional, and physical blocks which obscure the ever-present alignment <clears throat> of the authentic self, capital S self. Working with clients online as well as in person, her practice is international, spanning four continents. Her clientele is diverse, racially, socioeconomically, and sexual orientation. Leanne is the author of Consciousness in Young and Patanjali, which I've been reading, um, <clears throat> as well as several academic papers. Her published papers include Innate and Emergent, Young Yoga and the Archetype of the Self Meet the Objective Measures of Effective Neuroscience, and Young in Dialogue with Freud and Patanjali, Instinct, Effective Neuroscience, and the Reconciliation of Science and Religious Experience both for the open access journal Cosmos and History, the Journal of Natural and Social Philosophy. So, if that all sounds kind of intellectual to you, and the fact that she has a PhD, don't let it scare you. Um, if I'm able to read and appreciate and understand this book, uh, I think anyone will appreciate this conversation. Leanne and I were just talking for a few minutes beforehand about some themes which we would like to discuss in this interview, and we're both kind of excited about those themes, and I, I, think, uh, I think everyone will pick up on that excitement as we have this conversation. So, thanks, Leanne. Thanks, Rick. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's start with a little bit of your personal background, just so people know who you are and why you went in the direction you did with your research and your writing and everything. Okay, uh, well first I, I started studying the mind-body connection in my 20s because I became very ill. Mm -hmm. I, in retrospect, I can look at it as a sort of psycho-spiritual breakthrough mm -hmm. uh, that, that impacted me physically. At the time, I couldn't have said that, but now in retrospect I can say that. Uh, and then in my uh, early 30s, I had what is known in the religious studies literature as a pure consciousness event. Mm -hmm. I had never studied any of the Eastern liberatory traditions. Um, Indian philosophy was com you know, completely foreign to me. Now, I was in a yoga asana room when the event happened. But doing asana? I had no doing asana, yeah. Okay. Well, not doing asana at that moment, but just I, had just, <laughs> I had just finished, yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I knew nothing of pure consciousness or pure consciousness events. So I came out of the middle of nowhere, and that and set me on like? a path. What was the experience like? It was like a burst of light mm -hmm. that was self-luminous, all-knowing awareness. Eyes, eyes closed, eyes open? Eyes open. Oh. And you, were you still able to see people in the room and stuff, or was the light sort of over, it just kind of became your whole experience? I was actually looking in somebody's eyes mm -hmm. at that moment. Mm -hmm. And the, just a burst of light. The, one way I can describe it is almost like Bindu chakra just burst open. Yeah. Um, so non non duality. The understanding of non duality became incontrovertible. Actually, the understanding of pure consciousness, mm -hmm. that that uh, that truth, the absolute nature of pure mm -hmm. consciousness. Um, 
And yeah, it was, it was n not a long period of time, but very impactful. Hmm. Could be that some chakra burst open at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I imagine you liked the experience. It didn't scare you or anything. It didn't scare me, but I didn't have a context for it. Mm -hmm. So it did um, very much shake the conditions on which I had been previously uh, immersed. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it shook them. Just you know, imagine an earthquake of a of a, of a very large magnitude. Huh. Uh, uh, so I, I had to. Well, I've spent really the last you know period of time reconciling that experience with the conditions which I was brought up to prior to that experience. Yeah, there are great poets and so on who had just a flash of experience like that and <clears throat> they spent the rest of their lives writing poetry about it and w without ever even having any more experiences, but, um, you know, and a lot of times people have these things out of the blue, they don't know, they haven't been doing anything which would be conducive to such an experience, it just happens. Well, you, you had just been doing some asanas, so that helps. Right, right, and I had been practicing asana probably for eight months at that time, mm -hmm. regularly. But no, um, no kind of meditation thing, just asanas. No meditation, and, and again, no philosophical context to understand that when you move the nerve centers, you are actually opening the possibility. That's why asana is one of Patanjali's eight limbs. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in some respect, we could say asana is no joke. You, if, you, if, you, if you enter the yogic practice and you move those, um, those nadis and those nerve centers, then uh, a pure consciousness event really becomes available for sure through that that practice. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but I, I heard that there was a great sage in India named Tatwala Baba, mm -hmm. and I heard that asanas was his main practice. Um, but he, he was awesome. He kind of blew people away with his presence and darshan. <clears throat> so it's possible. Um, you know, I, I think generally speaking, most people say it's good to sort of pull several legs of the table at once, you know, um, not just work on the body with asanas, but, you know, do meditation, do pranayama, do various other things. Um, and usually that's what ends up happening, right, when, when you get into something like this. <clears throat> well, right, because, see, I had no scriptural study at that point. So pranayama and asana kind of go hand in hand. When you're right. in an asana room, you're learning the breathing practices. But as, as far as the yamas or the niyamas, I can't say that that was really infused in the asana practice as it was being taught to me at that time. Right. Hints. Hints. Oh, but but there, there wasn't a lot of, you know, there was not no philosophical study. Yeah. Uh, during the course of this interview, I want to talk with you about yamas and niyamas, and we can get into it in some detail. Um, so did this kind of flash... Of, a, of an experience inspire you to <clears throat> be more diligent or to learn some kind of spiritual practice and do it regularly? Oh, for sure. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it radically reordered my life. There was no, there was no going back mm -hmm. because it was incontrovertible. It was, mm -hmm. you know, pure consciousness is absolute. It knows it's self luminous. It's self knowing. So I, I, then engaged in study and practice in order to merge my everyday reality with that, what seemed at the time very obscure knowing, because it's mm. that that pure consciousness is so strikingly absent in all of Western thought. Mm. As as a woman, totally conditioned and and grown up in in Euro American culture, again I had no reference for it. So I I spent you know, again you know another decade and a half trying to merge the Euro-American reality to this knowledge that pure consciousness is absolute. I think most listeners here will be familiar with what we mean by pure consciousness, but in case they're not, let's just talk about that a little bit. Um, what, is, what is pure consciousness in your understanding and experience? Well, I can tell you the qualities of it, which we've been discussing already. It's self-luminous, singular, eternal, absolute. Um, through Orthodox Indian philosophy, there's a term Brahman that's often equated with pure consciousness, or, or Brahman, it, it really eludes a, a simple English translation, but it is translated as pure consciousness or being consciousness bliss, the absolute, sometimes S. Satchitananda, yeah. Satchitananda, yeah, S with a capital S self. Mm -hmm. um, so by pure consciousness, I really am alluding also mm -hmm. to, that, to that term Brahman. Right. And... Um, and you've also alluded to the Western understanding of consciousness, which I think is predominantly that consciousness is 
somehow produced by the neurochemistry of the brain, um, although no one can really explain how. Um, but I think when you, when you say pure consciousness, you mean something very different than that. I do. I mean pure consciousness as the reality of being, which is why one of the definitions of Brahman would be being consciousness bliss. Mm -hmm. So being and pure consciousness are, we could say, synonymous, if you will. Yeah. I think we could. <laughs> I mean, it, actually, you can begin to parse these terms much more finely, and and but I'm not. I, I usually don't have feel I'm, I'm qualified to get really down into fine distinctions. There's, there's a fellow whom I've interviewed named David Buckland who writes about this a lot on his website and gets into the kind of subtleties between Brahman and consciousness and para Brahman and so on and so forth. So if any, anyone is interested in that, they should. Uh, look up David's interviews and his, look at his website. But in any case, the, the main idea here is that consciousness is not, rather, not merely an a epiphenomenon of brain functioning, but it's kind of the fundamental reality of the universe, and um, the universe arises from it or emerges from it or appears to, uh, right? Right, exactly. So yeah. fundamental, it's the reality, the reality of, of our being, of beingness. Right. Co consciousness is e equated to that, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So therefore, a reality, you know, consciousness, it, it, to know, to know with, it has knowledge structured in it. Whereas in the Western, um, many, of the, many of the fields, in, uh, the interdisciplinary fields of consciousness studies through a Western lens, as you're saying, um, they're looking at consciousness as an epiphenomenon or a byproduct of brain function. Right. Um, this idea of pure consciousness is very different. Um, brain, mind, anything phenomenological is an activity in consciousness, so to speak, mm -hmm. as consciousness. That I always find that preposition very hard. Um, but but consciousness, pure consciousness, being superior to any phenomena that would then reflect it or it would use as a vehicle for manifestation. Yeah, and um, a common analogy is that um, you know if you com if you compare an, um, consciousness to the electromagnetic field, we're not saying that they are the same thing, but and then the electromagnetic field can rate radios and televisions and cell phones and so on can detect fluctuations in the electromagnetic field, and in a similar way. Consciousness is universal, omnipresent, um, fundamental, and all the various forms uh, in creation reflect it to one degree or another. So yes. a mosquito reflects it as a mosquito can, and a dog as a dog can, a human being as a human being can. And as human beings, we have the capacity to improve upon our ability to reflect it. And so that's what spiritual practice is all about. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> about cl cleaning the lens of perception. And you bring up a very interesting point. Um, because if you turn away from it and don't reflect it, it, it it's still there vibrating. So yep. it still has you in its grip, regardless of what you're doing with, with your instrument of perception. It still, it still still has you in its perceptual eyesight. Huh. Yeah, so it's, it's there when you're asleep. It's there when you're dead. Um, it's, it's just there. Um, in fact, speaking of Tatwala Baba, um, again, uh, someone once said, do you sleep? And he said, what would happen to the universe if I slept? Meaning, you know, identifying as pure consciousness, you right. know, how the universe would crumble if that foundation of it were somehow, you know, turned off. Well, exactly. And that, that brings up, I mean, my whole work really in depth psychology or my attempts to bridge the approaches to consciousness between uh, the East and the West um, by... Um, conceptualizing an unconscious, which is ontically real, Western psychology does exactly what you were just pointing away from. Mm -hmm. It turns the universe off in a sense, and then human beings take ownership of consciousness and reflect it, it, and bring consciousness um, to the world. Do you see what I'm saying there? Um, clarify a little, and in the process, define the word ontic, because you use that a lot in your book, and I don't think that's a word people are familiar with. So ontology is theories of being. So ontic would be the reality of being. Mm -hmm. And so, for, for instance, the point we've been making about pure consciousness being the sort of foundation of everything—that's an on, the on, that's an ontic reality, you would say. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
and uh, Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. It's Jungian or in depth psychology that I'm that I, I mostly work in mm -hmm. in the fields of that. And uh, even though Jung doesn't have very clear metaphysics to his psychology, mm -hmm. he doesn't um, he doesn't make any metaphysical claims, so to speak. Really, his unconscious is real. It's the reality of being. The creator is unconscious and human beings become conscious and bring knowledge back to the creator. Huh. That's an interesting idea. I read about it in your book. Um, yeah, so if, I guess if the creator is unconscious, then how did the creator create? It's kind of like a pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps arrangement. It's that, it's, yeah, out of chaos, out of, um, you know, just just going out there and we just haphazardly happen to come into consciousness ourselves basically which again puts us in a, a, it puts us in, human beings in a more superior frame and, and there's where the jeopardy comes in with nature it puts us you see where it puts us if, if human beings evolutionary all of a sudden gain the consciousness mm -hmm. and we are superior to nature herself and her own fundamental reality of consciousness we become superior to nature mm -hmm. and I think right now in our time we can see the ravages of that thought process yeah um, so you think Jung was somewhat aligned with that notion that um, human beings are in some way superior to nature I, he, he was aligned with it because of the culture that he grew up in. He was doing his best to find his way back to it. But he, his blind, one of his blind spots was to actually see the cultural piece. He couldn't see how enmeshed he was in the thought, the philosophy of the unconscious hmm. a, as an ontic reality. He, he was so enmeshed and immersed in it, and that was his ground from which he was working. He, he didn't take note of that. Yeah, and he kept in, and for sure we can say that that, um, if, if you will, emotion, um, the feminine nature, or all things that Jung um, was grappling to to bring forward to humanity, but yet he kept hitting his own Achilles heel because he didn't see how the the philosophy he was working under just kept cutting him off at every turn with what he was actually trying to, I, I believe, trying to bring forward. Hmm. And of course he was aware of Eastern thought and yoga and, and, and stuff like that, um, but I guess he never was a serious practitioner of, of anything of that nature, right? He just was, he kind of studied it a bit intellectually? Yes, um, he did do asada um, for sure at different times um, when he was in emotional overwhelm and he absolutely studied Patanjali's classical yoga because he gave lectures on it. Mm -hmm. He studied kundalini yoga, um, but I want to say he didn't experientially practice it. He more intellectually studied it as opposed to in t experientially practicing it in order to be able to speak to it from that embodied place. Yeah. Um. You and I were talking before we started the interview about, well, I brought up a metaphor that perhaps is a little unfair to Jung, but maybe not, um, where someone like Patanjali and other sages of the East who had experiential methods for exploring consciousness and exploring deeper levels of reality <clears throat> um, are like scuba divers, you know, who can dive around deep in a, in a pond and see what's down there. Whereas someone who can just think about it and do, who doesn't have experiential methodologies is more like an ice fisherman or something who's sitting on the ice and kind of hoping there's fish down there and maybe he's got a little hole in the ice and he's fiddling around trying to catch some fish, but he really can't explore the depth experientially because he doesn't have the tools to do so. Um, I want to do say that, you know, Jung's tools brought about his theories on synchronicity mm -hmm. it, um, it in his culture and time um, to speak towards parapsychology and um, that kind of phenomena it still goes against the grain today even to speak about parapsychology and psychic phenomena so he had tools yes but 
he didn't have that ground of, of pure perception. So he was always immersed in the contents of consciousness. Mm. And um, the so whatever the tools he talk, had, they never gave him a glimpse of pure consciousness, as far as you can tell. No, he kept, he kept, oh, this is a super consciousness. I mean, in every way, again, he, he's around it at every turn. He's, look, he's almost trying to call it, but because he's so immersed in, in the culture and time and the philosophy of the unconscious, he can't see his blind spot. Mm. Um, <coughs> and uh, again, the contents were just so engrossing to him that um, relinquishing the contents to relax into what, what we would call through Patanjali's lens, Nirbija Samadhi, or even Asam Prajnata sam, Samadhi. Jung's levels of absorption always had some kind of content, some kind of object, some kind of conceptualization to it. Right. And um, he, he was under the belief that if one meditate, continued to meditate, Towards the Asam Prajnata or the uh, Nirbija Samadhi that Patanjali points to, Jung felt that Patanjali and the Buddha had, um, you know, their intuition had overreached itself. That 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 you would actually go unconscious huh. by by meditating and dropping all objects. Well, to be fair to him, I think that initially, one. I was just talking to some people last week um, who said, well, you know, we we went to this thing and and we and it really improved the quality of our meditation, and now when we meditate, we go into samadhi. But we're kind of like not aware we're in samadhi until we come out of it, and then we were aware that we were in it. Um, but, you know, then I said, I said, yeah, that eventually that, um, you become more and more aware of it as you're in it. And um, one of the guys said, yeah, um, he was beginning to experience that. Um, but I guess uh, Young just thought that Buddha and Patanjali and, and the others were, it, was, it sounds like he was trying to fit them into his worldview and not really taking the leap to um, to believe that they were onto something that he hadn't realized. That's right. He was trying to fit them on his terms. Yeah. Into his worldview, which again is this idea that um, the West, if you will, um, not a huge fan of that term, or Euro-American <laughs> culture, was in the midst of of constructing knowledge. And therefore, anything that came before couldn't have been as evolved, huh. because knowledge was evolving, and so therefore they had a lock on how, you know, how that evolution was happening. Yeah, churning it through their own intellect. Huh. Yeah, there's a sort of this conceit, isn't there, about um, how how wonderful and advanced we are, and how all, all the other cultures must have been primitive in some way. They don't, and in in a way, we know a lot of things that. The Buddha didn't know, or, or that Patanjali couldn't have known. You know, they they couldn't have taken a rocket ship to the moon, or um, you know, uh, explain quantum mechanics, or you know, many other things that we have come to understand. But they obviously had an expertise in an area which the West is deficient in, at least to my view. Yes, here might be the rub in that, though. So, okay, they didn't have that. Fair enough. But if our search is divorced from the field of pure consciousness. If our desire to go to the moon, or um, you know, go micro or macro, mm -hmm. is divorced from the field of pure consciousness, um, th that's the end of the Hatha Yoda Prada Pika. Then, then what can knowledge bring to you? Or, mm -hmm. or maybe that's also that Veda quote. It what is. Uh, people didn't hear me say that quote because we we're, were off camera. But there's a quote that um, if well, it's from the Rig Veda, but it says basically. The impulses of the Veda are, or the impulses of the laws of nature, which are which govern creation or are responsible for its manifestation, reside in pure consciousness. And if you don't know that field, those laws can't help you. They can't do anything for you. They can't, but what, but because they're laws, mm -hmm. they're going to get you. Yeah. So if you want to go to the moon, if you want to keep digging up the earth and taking her oil. You, you, you just can't keep ripping off material reality and looking into phenomena for an answer mm -hmm. because it's going to, because they're laws, see what I mean? You're yeah, going to no, back up totally. against it. You're you going to destroy smacked. yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's what we're doing. And so, I mean, let's just kind of put a, put a fine point on this. Um, 
you know, we're in a critical phase of humanity with global warming and a million other things that could destroy us, nuclear weapons, um, genetic engineering, all kinds of things which, you know, if they went awry, uh, and in many cases are already going awry, could exterminate not only our species but most species, maybe down to the cockroaches or something. And, um, you know, this is really the fruit of scientific knowledge, all the things I just mentioned and many others. So what is it about scientific knowledge that can give us such mixed blessings? Obviously, they have helped in many ways. We've eradicated smallpox and a million other beautiful things, but we've brought ourselves to the brink of extermination. What is, what, why, I think you've just said it, but I just want to sort of elaborate that. Go ahead. Sure. So, okay, we can go to the moon. Why wasn't looking at the moon from the earth enough? <laughs> what, what did you need to find up there? And now you've created all of that metal and whatever you needed to get up there. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. But again, if it's at the expense of the totality of the whole system, it's not worth embarking on. And I, I don't mean to pull that one instance yeah. out, but, but, but yet I need an instance to pull out mm -hmm. to say, if you pull it, it, that kind of examination um, out of the totality, you may hit a boundary. Um, and, and, and she has boundaries. She has laws. You can't break it down. You can't pollute your water supply. You can't talk, toxify your air supply and think your species will stay alive. You can't kill your habitat. Right. She has boundaries to her. Mm -hmm. And if we don't realize that, that those, that knowledge, that dharma, those laws are structured in pure consciousness, we're going to just keep spiraling on this building up of knowledge at the expense of the knowledge that sits right in our heart. Yeah. And right in our gut. Mm -hmm. and right in the field between us. Yeah, I think it was Thoreau who said, um, you know, go ahead and build castles in the air. That's where they belong, but just put foundations under them. And um, I, I would say, I, I kind of dig technology and stuff. I think, you know, I think it was kind of cool that we went to the moon. I mean, it gave us Tang, among other things. Um, <laughs> if people don't remember, Tang was like a orange-flavored powder you could put in water. And made it, they, they actually developed that for the astronauts. Um, but... It, these, um, I think it's natural for human beings to want to know more and be more and expand their territory of influence and all that stuff. But if you don't simultaneously b dig your foundation, build your foundation, and we're, we're alluding to pure consciousness here, then these efforts can be very misguided. Right. And, and, and so often have been. Right. And that's why, uh, um, again, for me, the logical consistency that I see in Patanjali's yoga psychology or the six orthodox Hindu philosophies is they call it the ground. Yes. It's quite literally the ground. If you leave the ground now and you're divorced from it um, and you're in the scene without any kind of reference to the seer, mm -hmm. now we're in trouble. Yeah. There's a line in the Gita which says, For many branched and endlessly diverse are the intellects of the irresolute, but the resolute intellect is one-pointed. And so, you know, you can go way out on limbs. You can uh, and not see the connection between the limb you're on and all the other limbs, or spokes of a wheel, if you will. Um, but if you, if you can sort of get to the resolute hub of that wheel, then you see all the spokes as emanating from you. And functioning from there, you function in harmony with all the diversity of life. Functioning out on some branch, you violate laws of nature unwittingly. I couldn't agree more, absolutely. I mean, it's just another way of making the same point. It's beautiful. Be beautiful and tragic at the same time because we're not understanding that. Like, you and I are having this dialogue, but as, a, again, I'll just speak to Euro-American culture, mm -hmm. we, we don't understand that. We're way out on branches. Yeah. We, we have the sap divorced from the tree, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is, you know, leaving us in the situation that we're in with the leaders that we're, you know, putting into office, mm -hmm. with the environmental... Um, uh, Degradation. Yeah, that we're facing. Yeah. And, and but the fact that we're talking about it is good. And I think that, you know, I mean, we don't want to pat ourselves on the back too much, but we might be, you know, avant-garde, uh, you know, we might be harbingers of, of a broader um, understanding that will be eventually become more commonplace in the culture and that, that could um, really 
reorganize things in a more beneficial way. For... Right. Well, my whole body of w w work, I would say, is a voice to bringing pure consciousness into Western thought. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's so strikingly absent. Yeah. And again, reading Jung really uh, brought it to life for me because at every turn, it's almost like he's seeing it, he's getting it, but he's not getting it because he's so immersed in, in his own culture. Um, so that's why I use him sort of as a touchstone mm -hmm. in this uh, dialogue. You know, I take this dialogue between him and Patanjali to show uh, where they diverge, um, and I think they diverge at very important points that we need to really understand. Yeah. Well, we're going to keep talking about it, you and I, for the next hour and a half, and, um, I, and I do see this kind of conversation and understanding seeping into the culture more and more. Um, and there are spokesmen on either side. I mean, obviously articulate people who, you know, have an atheistic viewpoint but are nonetheless brilliant and, and keep butting up against, you know, people who are kind of saying the things we're saying, but dialogues are taking place. And, um, you know, I'm sure you've read Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revo Revolutions. I yes. haven't actually, no. Okay. So one of his, he popularized the, the term paradigms and, you know, how a paradigm becomes the sort of predominant worldview of, of a scientific discipline. Um, and, and he kind of analyzed in depth the, the mechanism of paradigm shift, how anomalies come along, which just keep clashing with the established understanding. And initially they can be dismissed and ignored, but eventually the anomalies become kind of um, predominant enough that the paradigm has to shift. Um, and this has happened time and time again in, in various sciences. So I, th I think there are a lot of anomalies to the materialistic worldview that regards matter as as dead, you know, stuff and the universe is a random accident of some sort and consciousness is merely a product of the brain. When the brain dies, that's it, lights out forever for that, that person. There are a lot of lots of evidence that that refute those perspectives. And um, I think that they are building and, and create creating a pressure on those who adhere to those perspectives that will eventually uh, you know well, so, someone said science progresses by a series of funerals, but sooner or later, I think the paradigm will shift in society at large. It has to. Well, I, I mean, I agree. I hold out that. Um, but what comes up for me when you're saying that is sci orthodox science seems also to be very married to, can I say, predatory capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's well funded. It's very hegemonic. I mean, it's very entrenched. Um, you know, fundamental, almost become fundamentalist yes. uh, in many ways. Now, because um, these two systems are married, especially like in the fields of psychiatry and psychology, you know, then you, what's being funded sort of is medication and, and medicines for people's anxiety. Mm -hmm. So instead of encouraging people to say, hey, maybe the worldview is a little off, and maybe that's why there's a lot of sick people, psychologically sick people, because uh, uh, an unhealthy worldview can't possibly have healthy citizens. Well, as of yet, that's not, I mean, it is happening, but it's, again, it's happening on the fringes and it, it will take a lot to move that marriage of, of money and fundamentalism to, to get it to, to shift. I'm not saying it's not possible. I hold out, absolutely hold out the vision that it is. Um, I'm just saying it is very entrenched. Yeah, in your book you quote Jung as having said that um, scientific materialism and religious fundamentalism arose from the failure of religious structures and traditions. And so what I think he's saying there is that somehow the, the, the religious structures and traditions, if they were um, primarily responsible for providing the experience of transcendence and enabling people to live that in daily life as the foundation of their life, um, they appear to have failed because that experience has not been very common seems now to be experiencing a resurgence, but it hasn't been very common. And, you know, as a result of which, you and I have just been saying, scientific materialism and religious fundamentalism arose from that. What is religious fundamentalism? It's sort of the adamant insistence that a particular belief is correct without necessarily having the experiential verification of that belief. And that's why re religious fundamentalists are so rigid and, and strident. They're, they're def they feel defensive because their belief doesn't underpin their, I mean, their experience doesn't underpin their belief. Right. It, it, I mean, it really strips 
if we could use the term authentic power from them because it it puts power in the theory it takes power out of the body out of the whole mind body connection the wisdom of that system which uh, we still have a long way to go in order to really you know express that in a coherent mind body psychology in the west um, but by you know using priest or a god that's outside oneself um, you, you know where's the where's the human power in that as you're saying there's no direct experience in there you're having experience with the book with the text with the theory but you're not having a direct spiritual emotional physical experience on yeah, the ground right so what I, would, what I would like to suggest here just for the record <laughs> is that anything any religion ever talked about or any philosophy or any any such thing any metaphysics um, sh can be taken and perhaps should be taken as an hypothesis that can actually be investigated. Um, you know, the whole issue, whether God exists, whether angels exist, anything. Um, it's not something to believe or disbelieve, and I don't think the founders of religion really wanted you necessarily to believe what they said. They wanted you to experience what they were experiencing. And, um, and maybe they were providing means to do that when they were alive, but perhaps those means got distorted and lost over time. And perhaps we're at a stage now where people are rediscovering them and, you know, being able to investigate experientially and, um, all of these religious and spiritual and metaphysical claims. Right, yeah, I think there is a, a big shift in people uh, looking outside religion, so to speak, organized religion, and, and finding um, other organizations or, or more sort of nature or looking, again, to their own direct experience through meditation, mm -hmm. through yoga practice. Um, I, I thought of one thing that you, because of what you said a little bit earlier, I don't want to segue if you have something else. Oh, we can, we can keep segueing. We can always segue back again if we want to. Okay. Um, you know, the arg to me, the arguments between Buddhism Orthodox Hinduism and non-Orthodox Hinduism are pretty significant. Now, I don't know if that's what you were alluding to when you're talking about these dialogues that are happening current day in atheism, and because um, I know I've heard, um, you know, quite a few speakers who are Buddhists, so to speak, and, and certainly meditate, but they're they're definitely atheists. Yeah, like Sam of, Harris. Like, <laughs> you and I were thinking of the same person. Yes. Yeah. Um, who, yes. a, who, in my opinion, is a fascinating guy. I listen to his podcast, but boy, he's a tough nut to crack. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> right. And again, they hang on to this notion of, of no self. Right. But if you look at the evolution of Buddhism, the self, something absolute, this, uh, um, uh, which is the real, which is self-sovereign and self-knowing, is brought back in um, through the Tathagatagaba sermons and texts <clears throat> Um, which derived from, again, the sermon um, on Buddha's last day on earth. And, and that's brought in through Mahayana Buddhism. So I, I do think it's important to look at the evolution of Buddhism mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and not just certain texts. And, and Buddhism, um, you know, there's a lot of texts there, and I certainly haven't studied them all. Mm -hmm. um, I obviously went after the ones um, that I wanted to, to utilize to, 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 to bring a marriage back between Buddhism and sort of yoga, because the Buddha w was someone who practiced yoga, and you can see a lot of similarities between Mahayana Buddhism and Patanjali Yoga. You know, I happen to have one file on my desktop that I hadn't put away. I always like to keep a clean desktop on my computer, but this one was sitting there, and it's, it's the Buddha on no self. And here, I think this was from Timothy Conway, um, who's a good friend of mine, I've been on Bad Gap a couple times, but he said what the Buddha meant by anatta was not no self, but not self. He clearly repeatedly taught that the five aggregates of personhood, body, sensations, perceptions, samskara reactions, and the personal consciousness, vinana, are not, are not who I am, not myself. Uh, he did not say there are no persons. And this is quite contrary to what so many misunderstanding Buddhists, including many teachers and academics, and Neo-Advaitins teach today. They interpret anatta as no persons whatsoever, which is a recipe for depersonalization syndrome. That's right. That's right. And, and um, also in that Tathagatagava sermon, um, the Buddha explicitly says, if you keep going around in the no-self concept, 
it's like a moth going to a flame. Like you just keep getting burnt mm. at some point. Yes, it, it's emptiness of the conditions, but then there's a resting in something deeper that's absolute. Mm -hmm. And again, you can find it in, in Buddhism, but a lot of the atheists who are, could we say, co-opting Buddhism for their own means um, are not taking a look at the whole evolution of that discipline hmm. in its various factions. Interesting. Um, but it's important, Yeah. I think. Yeah. The whole thing about... Let's let's talk about atheism for a minute, just for fun, because the the idea came up. Um, I can't. I don't presume to you know, be able to articulate atheism the way a full fledged atheist would do. But as I understand it, it's well. Obviously, the term means that you don't believe in God. And you know, if I were to talk to Sam Harris, I would probably say, well, I don't believe in the same God you don't believe in, because he keeps taking pot shots at, at very silly religious, um, you know traditions that, that got kind of a little strange. Um, but to me, when I look at anything in creation, um, you know, my, my fingernail, and contemplate what I'm actually looking at in terms of the subtle, you know, and, and microscopic structures there and how orderly they are and how, how they abide by certain biological and physical laws and so on and so forth, it is so, it's so obviously not a random accident. You know, so there's so obviously some sort of intelligence that's that's governing or orchestrating it, and and that is true of eh, the entire universe, as as far out as you want to go, and you take any little tiny point, and there it is. So, I mean, to me, God is kind of like hiding in plain sight. Yeah, absolutely. Some people do say, right, this is a game of hide and seek, um, and I think the Sanskrit term is rita, rita, like the, the rhythm. Yeah, is that the divine or like because there's the Ritambara imprint, right? In, right. in, in, in Patanjali Yoga, which is the truth bearing imprint. Yes. And um, so that intelligence that you're talking about in that order, it's, it's so here, if, if this is pure consciousness and here's the mind, it's either mirroring it in, in this nice, yummy marriage or it's like splitting off here, but that imprint, <clears throat> no matter how far away, you get from the ground, that imprint remains because it's built into the intelligence of the system. Mm -hmm. So you light up the imprint and then the mind comes back to rest in its true nature. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what meditators are doing if not somehow accessing or attempting to access that imprint. I think that's what most meditations aim to do. Um, but let's now, okay, let's segue into that. So the second verse of the Yoga Sutra is, you know, Yoga Chitta Vritti Naroda, which means yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. And you talk about that quite a bit in your book. <clears throat> and um, it's probably, you know, one of the, well, it's, it's, it's not the second verse of the Yoga Sutras by accident. Patanjali actually con considered it significant. So let's consider the significance of it. I'll let you take it from here. <clears throat> right. So we, I mean, we could say he sums up his whole psychology and philosophy in that one line. Right. So does, does this work? You see, so I'm saying this is pure consciousness. Here's the mind when it's, mm -hmm. when it's married to pure. So when it starts moving mm -hmm. and fluctuating and it's no longer silent, it's in its thought forms, mm -hmm. it, that, that union becomes avidya, there, there's the, uh, the blindness, non-wisdom, misunderstanding, it becomes, we become blinded yeah. um, through the vibration, um, when the vibration is divorced, again, from its ground in pure consciousness. So really, he takes 195 lines to continue to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, 195 is already so, always, already so short as it is, but it was it's so succinct for him to sum it up in that way still in the silence in that pure being that then aliveness is it, it's it's felt it's embodied it, the life is known instead of now being represented through a thought form yeah through a construct 
let's use a metaphor to make it more clear for people. So the sun is shining, let's say the sun is, represents pure consciousness, and it's shining on a, a very still lake. Um, I'm sure we've all seen this kind of thing where the, the light bouncing off the lake is blinding because the sun is being reflected so, so well by the water. But if a wind picks up and the water starts to get turbulent, then the reflection is no longer that clear, it's no longer blinding. Um, so the idea is that if the mind is agitated, it can't reflect pure consciousness very well. Um, and so Patanjali advocates, you know, stilling the mind in order to have that clear, to restore or come back to that clarity that relies at the very foundation of our life or of our mind. Right. And if I could just bring the cultural piece back in, mm -hmm. we're, as a as a culture, where we live in a lot of agitation. Mm -hmm. um, look, I love technology too, um, but you know that just even now the instinct to keep picking it up and <laughs> see if you, you, you have red dots on your application um i don't have one know. of those by the way oh you don't no for you <laughs> cell phone i have a, an old clunker the flip phone that sits in the car good for you <laughs> when you speak about the agitation you bring up a very rich point again but going back to the cultural piece as a culture we live in a very agitated state of mind because everything is running towards, again, the capitalistic market, um, at least the way that I see it, you know, a lot, a lot is running towards the capitalistic market. Mm -hmm. The mind runs, how, how can I objectify myself to put myself in the market so I can make money because money has become equated with well-being. And therefore, my accumulation of capital is equated to, again, my well-being. So there's a lot of agitation that takes place um, inside that paradigm, inside that culture, and that thought structure. A lot of my clients that I, I, I see, I mean, they're heavily they, filled with anxiety because they're, they're having a spiritual practice, but yet they're still trying to fit themselves into a culture that is so chronically busy. Um, so again, this goes back to the point that we've been making almost for the past hour. Pure consciousness is strikingly absent in Western thought. It's not even there as a ground for people to touch into. So they're just a lot of people without spiritual practices or without any kind of knowledge of pure consciousness are trying to find a ground within the agitation, within that which isn't stable and immutable and absolute. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, kind of uh, trying to find an absolute or, or a, a rock of to anchor to in something which is relative and transitory. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I've, I heard recently um, that there were only 66 years elapsed from Kitty Hawk, when the Wright, Wright brothers first, first flew their little plane, to Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon. So obviously there's been a huge acceleration of technological progress, and I suspect that since Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, we've made at least as much progress um, if you can call it, if you want to call it progress. But in any case, the pace of life has increased tremendously. And um, realistically, can we expect that to stop? You know, can we expect every, everybody to go back to an agrarian society where we're just all sitting around, you know, uh, and things are slower paced? I don't think so. So, you know, let's say a donkey has to carry a load. You have two options, lighten the load or strengthen the donkey if the load is getting too heavy. I don't know if we can slow down the pace of, of society or the pace of change, so I think we need to supplement it or, you know, build a foundation under it to allude to Thoreau again uh, in terms of this pure consciousness you're talking about so that one can manage the pace of change and, and this, the constant barrage of stimuli that, that uh, we're... And of course, you can limit your own barrage. You don't have to watch television all the time or be looking at your cell phone all the time, but Nonetheless, the, the, the society is in a very agitated, busy state, and I think you, know, you can't squelch that or suppress it. You have to sort of infuse into it the silence of pure consciousness in order for things to become rebalanced. I hear that. Um, um, but also, if, if the, if the quote-unquote change falls on the individual. Now the individuals make up the collective. So let's let's dialogue through this here. Yeah. So, you know, the individuals are are um, making that effort towards the silence and towards the stillness which has everything to do with their nervous system. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and decompressing the anxiety and being able to breathe and function without stress. Now, what you're saying is, well, they're, they're going to have to re, I think this is what you're saying, they're going to have to re-enter the stressful environment because that pace is going to keep going the way it is. So hopefully they're going to be able to re-enter now with the calmed nervous system and be able to um, negotiate that stress, but in a way where their nervous system stays anxiety-free? I think that's, yeah, I think I'm saying that, but I, I mean, obviously there's a lot of agitation and stimuli that you don't need to indulge in, and that many people do indulge in looking for some kind of fulfillment. You know, once you st start finding inner fulfillment, you can sort of dispense with all that stuff. Um, but nonetheless, you may need to have a job. <laughs> Most people do, and you need to go to work with, um, you know, people who don't meditate or whatever. And um, so you can't just kind of like, you know, live on welfare and, and hide out in a, in a cabin someplace. Um, most people can't. So there, for most people, again, there needs to be some kind of um, way of managing the pace of life and strengthening the nervous system so that it can deal with the necessary stimuli anyway uh, without getting stressed out by it. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, and, and that would be some kind of sort of perhaps incremental change. Yeah. Is there a radical change ahead for us? I, that's possible too, only in the sense that if, if our food supply um, is tainted, if our water supply is tainted, our air supply, there's going to be more of a radical shift than mm -hmm. there is a gradual shift. Yeah, yeah. In which case, um, that sort of frenetic pace that you're speaking of, uh, I believe, would actually shift back to, you know, not an agrarian, uh, you know, reality like it was before, but certainly something closer to it. Um, and and I don't know if you know um, New Thinking Aloud, Jeffrey Mishlove's channel, but I, I just listen, oh yeah, I listen to both your interviews with him. Okay, well, he interviews. Um, Psychic phenomena. He's really into psychic phenomena, mm -hmm. and he has a degree in parapsychology. And I believe it's an interview he did with Stephen Schwartz, where um, Stephen took remote viewers and had them look into the future, mm -hmm. and they do see a, a return to nature. Now, yeah. again, that's not to say that that's what's going to happen, but that is what mm -hmm. what I forget the sample size that he took, um, but what was shown. Well, I agree with you. I, I mean, I think that there are so many things that. Um are untenable, un unsustainable, and that really, if we're going to survive, that need to somehow cease to function or cease to exist. Uh, but we're not going to forget all the knowledge we know. You know, when, all the things that science, unless there's some kind of huge, you know, uh, dis huge destruction that would destroy all the all the records of, of human knowledge that have been accumulated. Um, so, you know, when we know a heck of a lot more than we did. 100, 200, 1,000 years ago. So that stuff is still going to be known. Um, but I think a return to nature will probably mean um, a return to sort of a balance where um, we are able to possess this knowledge in a way that doesn't shoot ourselves in the foot, you know, that, that can render it benign rather than destructive. Well, right, because it returns to the question we said earlier: Is the knowledge that we know useful? Is it is it, is it even beneficial? Yeah. If if you have a Monsanto or um, you know some corporation that has the power to perhaps um, uh, you know take the food supply and take what was organic and healthy and change it and mutate it into something that's that's no longer that the body can no longer process in a way. Um, that's actually viable and healthy for it. So yes, it, there's all this knowledge bank that we've built up, but but I think it's going to come back, come to a point where we have to look and say, well, is that knowledge heading us towards something that's beneficial, or is it heading us away from the true nature, from sitting in something that's authentic and natural, which allows our species, our species to survive. Yeah, I agree. And thrive at the same time. I agree. It's, it seems like what needs to happen is the ambient level of consciousness of society has to be such that anyone who tries to use knowledge in, in a destructive way will just be so out of place and that they won't get the support or, or have the ability to do it. But we're speaking kind of idealistically here, but... <laughs> you know, yeah, I know, I, I know, but when you look at world leaders, I think it's a really important point. And that speaks to, you know, in, in schools, 
um, <clears throat> understanding knowledge. How does the mind work? I mean, these are fundamental, especially with all the shootings that are happening now yeah. in our culture. Like, how does the mind work? What is the psychosomatic unity? I mean, that should be sort of, you know, 101 through elementary school. So everybody, again, has a ground towards that unification of the body and mind um, against what, what I would say is pure consciousness, which is a very necessary component. Yeah. And it wouldn't, it's, I mean, it's obviously feasible to teach stuff in schools that would enable kids to have access to pure consciousness from an early age. It's actually being done through the TM movement, through stuff like Cavalier Morgan is doing up in Portland and, and elsewhere. Um, it just needs to become widespread. And if it did, then the, the culture could really shift. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and yeah. much more understand, and the, the, the mind-body split that, that we've suffered under um, for so long could also heal. Yep. Yeah, so I mean, the, it's not like hopeless, the, the, our predicament. The, the, the solutions are there. And, and not only, you know, spiritual solutions, but te many technological solutions are there, you know, in terms of like, you know, cleaning up the environment or having alternative energies that don't pollute and, and health-related health technologies and so on. That, that, so, like you keep referring to corporations and greed and all, a lot of these technologies are suppressed and opposed because they don't lie in anybody's pockets, at least the people who have control. Right. Right, but as you're saying, they are emerging and they are there. And if they get the support, if they can, you know, come out of the margins and into the mainstream, um, that would be very beneficial, yeah. probably, for the masses. <laughs> uh, so let's you and I keep doing what we're doing, and everybody else who's doing this sort of thing, and and you know maybe, maybe society will evolve into that. Again, I feel a little funny because I feel like we're proclaiming ourselves to be the, you know, the transformational agents of, of the world, but I don't know, maybe we are in some small way. Well, the dialogue is necessary. Yeah. That, that, that's for sure. So um, wherever the dialogues can take place, um, you could say, you know, dialogue and transformation at, at this stage, something like this, go hand in hand because the dialogue is so important at this point. Yeah. Okay. Back to Patanjali. And, um, and at any point, you know, feel free to throw in other things, you know, young, anything else you want to talk about as we go. But um, in terms of Patanjali, um, he wrote the Yoga Sutras, and, he, and it has four chapters. And some of the things he talks about, he talks about various stages or degrees of samadhi. Um, and some of those stages per pertain to what we were saying, that initially pure consciousness can be a glimpse, but eventually it can get integrated or stabilized. So it, it's a, a continuum in the midst of activity. It's not lost no matter what you're doing. Um, you want to comment on that before we, before I say anything else? Yeah, I mean, I would say the yoga is a philosophy of integration. Mm -hmm. um, yoga is a process and, and ultimately, you know, yoga is both a process and a view of, of reality in its integrated wholeness. Mm -hmm. Yoga is that union. So, Anything that has been split off, whether it's the mind-body split, me from you, us from them, um, the universal from the individual, transcendent from imminent, all those splits um, through the process of, of, of meditation and of samadhi absorption, um, they have the opportunity to, um, I want to say reintegrate, even though, again, in some sense, They've never lost that integration. What happens is the, sick, the sickness is what happens. Mm -hmm. the, the illness is what happens. But, and that's why they are so integrated and can always find their way back home. Because, again, that, that Ritambara imprint never loses its thread. That's why pure consciousness is pure. Mm -hmm. it, it's pure. It can't be defiled. There is no other. There is no ultimate object. It is itself. So when we take the mind and we co-opt it, co-opt consciousness in some sort of, um, you know, Patanjali in his yamas, what, what is it, non-stealing, non-covetousness. But again, in your American culture, that's kind of what we did. We have the ego as the seat of consciousness. And so we steal it, so to speak. We're mm. thieves. And as you break off, what you get now is the um, dissociation between the mind and the body and the illness um, in that uh, system, if you will. And, but again, 
because pure consciousness is the the intelligence and the self-knowing awareness do you see what I'm saying where the integration is already there that's the the integration is the thread that you follow back in for wholeness and healing yeah well, that that evokes a couple of thoughts in me I mean one is that the, like the word Maya you know me which is usually translated as illusion means literally that which is not um, and Shankara has the famous story of the this, the rope being mistaken for a snake and creates all kinds of turbulence and fear and upset and everything else just because the vision is not clear. But the rope was never a snake, you know. Right. And, and so all this craziness and ignorance and suffering and everything else that, that seems so real, if you really get right down to it, um, has always just been sort of uh, a misperception. Um, and that it's actually, as the Brahma Sutra, or as the as the Upanishad says, all this is that still yes. already. Um, yes. We're just not seeing it, the world as it actually is, uh, and therefore mistaking it. We we live in fear. We live in upset. We live in turbulence. A hundred percent. So when we turn that lens back around, mm -hmm. come home, so to speak. Yeah rest inside the absolute because it's always there it was always there it doesn't leave there's no way to break off from it there's just suffering that happens and suffering we could say is a huge marker it's just a big red flag yo you turned in the wrong direction yeah yeah there was one um fundamental principle of meditation the way i learned it and practice it which is that um it's actually enjoyable for the mind to settle down, to, to, for this cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. The, as we get closer to pure consciousness, so to speak, um, the, we and it begins to be experienced more fully, we experience the ananda aspect of it more and more, greater and greater bliss. So the mind just will naturally fall into that if given the correct angle and allowed to do so. Yes, absolutely. And again, that's what sh also indicates the mind-body unity and why Brahman, I believe, is translated as, you know, being consciousness bliss. Mm -hmm. It gives the embodied aspect to it. Yeah. So when the naysayers um, look at Hindu philosophy and they think of it as ultimately transcendent and otherworldly and, and, and something other, um, I, I believe that bliss aspect that you're pointing to is the indicator no that's not what they're saying at all they're saying it's right here right now yeah you know it's all a very right. practical thing when you get right down to it it's it's not i mean maybe there are people who've taken it in an otherworldly direction but as we've been talking about this whole time it has incredibly practical implications for day-to-day -day life as most of us live it yeah yes and yeah. that brings if i could just sort of bring in tibetan buddhism just for a brief second mm -hmm. um so all these realities are embedded in each other. In Tibetan Buddhism, they talk about their Nirmanakaya, their Sambhogakaya, and the Dharmakaya. So the Dharmakaya is, is, that, is that knowledge, right, of the, of the pure awareness, of the, of the, um, the self-sovereign, the unchanging, pristine cognition. But the Nirmanakaya, which is the, we could say, what Patanjali would call the worldly experience of the dualistic world of subject-object consciousness, it's embedded in it. Mm -hmm. So these are sort of nested realities mm. that that we can see through through the higher yoga tantras or the meditational practices, and then when when we see through them, um, you know, then then the choice becomes available again of which direction to turn towards. Am I going to turn toward? Uh, Bra and that's Brahma Kaira, uh, uh, you know, sitting in that sitting in that celibacy of Brahma knowledge of Brahman. As opposed to, do I turn? Am I going to stay here, or am I going to turn turn away from it? Now, if I've learned that this is suffering, I, I'm not going to make that turn. Hmm. In your own experience, you had that nice glimpse of pure consciousness 30 years ago, or whatever. Um, are you, but you seem like a very happy, integrated person. So I suspect that you know you have cultured that experience and allowed it to become a kind of pretty clear and foundational in, in your in your life. I mean, is that true? Yes, I, I would say because that moment was so absolute, in some sense it became foundational then, but what I had to do was the practices mm -hmm. in order to align my body in a way that that we're speaking of to, and I, I'm not 
saying I never have anxiety right. in a moment. I mean, all you have to do is talk to my 14 year old son and he'll be like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yes, have I purged, uh, have I purged a lot of conditions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you ever have a a moment, or, or did you have a did you have a sort of a watershed moment where you felt like there was this awakening, and then after that things were different thereafter, um, or was it sort of something that you know has just been growing incrementally, and you can't really pinpoint any such moment? Well, I would say they were both. So there, that pure consciousness event was a watershed moment, mm -hmm. and then from there, all the conditions, the part of me that was completely, well, how can that be? Because I'm it, it's so in this reality of subject-object consciousness, that then became incremental towards the mirror coming back mm. to rest in pure consciousness. Does Let's, that make sense? Yeah, it does. Let's talk about more about the mechanics of how this integration takes place. For instance, you know, Patanjali talks a lot about vasanas and samskaras and vrittis and kleshas and all that stuff, which are terms that are related to con the conditioning of the nervous system um, and and also the reversal of that conditioning through yogic practice. Mm -hmm. and, and through the lens of Jungian depth psychology, we'd call those complexes. Mm -hmm. So, again, there are areas of, of um, you know, great similarity between... Um, Jung and Patanjali were both concerned with the healing of human suffering and um, religious experience as an embodied experience. Um, so in both systems of thought, those complexes and the affect that sits at their core, yes, they have to be, you know, the Yoga Sutras, right, the threads of yoga. So you have to pull, pull those threads um, of conditioning, belief systems, construct, um, there's an affective core inside, which also impacts the nervous system. And so as those threads, as those complexes are depotentiated, um, one is able to take a comfortable seat in the body. Does that make sense? But, but I think it's important to understand that the, those habit patterns are, I mean, they're fierce. They're fierce and they, they have us, we don't have them. They, they will take us, it, it, in a moment, get triggered, and before we start this process of transformation, all of a sudden we're reactive and going down um, a path that we, in some sense, have no control over. Again, the complex has to us, and it takes us um, into wh whatever that condition is. So it's being able to spot them and then over time depotentiate them so we can integrate whatever um, all those thought forms that were enmeshed together so they can become integrated into the field of pure consciousness. Yeah, and so I think what we're saying here is that um, all this conditioning has a neurophysiological basis which is chemical and structural in its nature and that, um, you know, bringing about changes in the mind uh, correlates with transforming the physiology in a deep way. And I think perhaps when we talk about some scars or deep impressions that's, they're not just mental impressions or subtle body impressions. They, you know, if if modern physiology had the ability to do so, they they could actually be detected in the nervous system. But I don't think it does have the. Well, it does in a gross way. I mean, you can do MRI scans of the average person, uh, or someone with Alzheimer's, or someone who's been taking certain drugs, or someone who's been meditating 30 or 40 years, and you see really big differences in the way their brain looks. And you know the the the, tie, the term neuroplasticity is very popular these days about being able to actually change our brains. So we're we're talking about something physiological here as well as mental. Oh, absolutely. And again, you know, Freud was was right on this track. Even with his first case of Anna O, oh, he says, you know, energy had gotten along the long line. Energy had gone along the wrong lines, so mm -hmm. to speak, and that affect had built up in her system that's what they they the initial clients in psychoanalysis they had they had seen um these patterns again freud was actually a neurologist and then he became a psychoanalyst I didn't so know that. Yeah. yeah so the early days of depth psychology were a confluence mm -hmm. of psychology and neurology and, and now it's coming back in a very very strong way through the field of effective neuroscience mm -hmm. and um 
affect has long been part of depth psychology um, as an empirical means of entering the psyche. In other words, when that affect just, uh, again, grips us um, unawares, that, that's showing us the places where the complexes are held, things that are invisible to us, um, and we see that in Patanjali's yoga as well. He speaks about grief, and he's, um, you know, the sorrowless luminous. Mm -hmm. um, he points to the sorrowless luminous. So um, I think affect is another way also of bridging yoga and yang or bridging uh, Eastern and Western consciousness. It, affective neuroscience may be a way in, in my opinion, for us to bridge science and religious experience in the West, because that affect is life as she goes. I'll give her a feminine, mm -hmm. feminine term there. Um, affect is beyond conscious control. So it's life as it's coming forward again. So, so if you look here, right, um, as this turns away and affect builds up around, along certain lines, it's going to come. And again, there's quote unquote law. So it, it, it will come and uh, wake us up, not, not in the waking way that we're talking about through spirituality, but shake us up, I guess I could say, um, because it comes and bursts through. We can repress it maybe for a, a period of time, oppress it, suppress it, but at some point it, it has its say and it breaks through. And so um, affect may be a way now for, for us to look phenomenologically into, I, I believe, spiritual phenomena if what Patanjali is pointing to wh where we say the sorrowless luminous, so it's beyond grief. So if, if the affect of grief is symbolic, actually I can feel this as I'm saying it to you, is symbolic of that split from the home, from the ground, hmm. then that gives science a way in towards, um, again, reconciling science and religious experience. I just want to interject here that those who are wish, watching live, there might be about 150 people on right now, if you would like to ask a question, um, go to the upcoming interviews page on batgap.com and there's a, f a form at the bottom of that qu page through which you can submit a question. And that's true anytime I'm doing a, a, an interview over Skype um, or over the internet. So. Uh, Briefly define the word affect. I'm not so familiar with that term myself, and you just used it a lot. Um, it's it's basically an emotional response. Okay, and so you're, we're talking about conditioning here, and you're talking about emotional responses based upon deep impressions in the nervous system that condition our behavior. Is that what you're going? I'm with? talking about about so affect is just a natural occurring phenomena in nature um there's brilliant work that's been done by a man who's now passed away jack panks up and he um i'm not a huge fan of studying through other animal species but he has looked at several other species and he has found across all mammals actually i think he even found in birds um, and reptiles as well seven subcortical emotional centers common to all sentient beings. Mm -hmm. um, seeking, maternal care, joyful play, grief, um, rage, fear, and lust. I think mm -hmm. I just named them. Um, and also through this research, it shows that the, the brain stem is instinctively conscious, whereas the cortex derives its consciousness from the brainstem. The brainstem is, has a, an affective core. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we're looking across all different species to see how that affect is, uh, the, those seven emotional centers uh, reside, it's part of our makeup. Okay. Again, it's part of the laws. And so Patanjali actually alluded to this or addressed this and, and how does this what you're saying now relate to the idea of enlightenment or waking up? How would an enlightened or awakened person um, function with regard to these emotional centers as compared to a, an average person? Okay. Now, enlightenment and awakening, all these terms 
today. Well, we I kind know. of have a lot, of, right? <laughs> right? Right? I know. I hesitate to use the E word ever, but even even awakening, you know, you, you just have to spend half an hour defining what you're talking about. But but let's just say we, we all have some kind of idea of what these mean, some kind of realize level of realization or or um, self. Let's say self realization. Someone who is sort of landed in in um, the recognition in an abiding sense that they are pure consciousness. They're not merely an individual biological entity. Okay, I like that. I like that as, as, as a definition for sure. But again, because I had that pure consciousness event, but what I didn't have was an embodied way to actually ground that pure consciousness in my own system. Right. To me, that's a whole different. That's a lifelong uh, project. But it's a, it's just a, it, it's a whole other gestalt. It's, mm -hmm. and again, I think that's what Patanjali is pointing to when he see he talks about Kavalya. Yes. He doesn't even he doesn't even mention moksha. He's Kavalo, Kavalya, which is to rest upon oneself. So also, the word means alone. Uh, I think it has to do with oneness, the the sense that I am alone in this in in that I am I am that and that alone is. Yes, absolutely. Yes. It can be translated as aloneness, mm -hmm. and I've also seen it translated as to rest upon oneself. Mm -hmm. So again, Brahman... And I don't think there's a contradiction there, actually. <laughs> no, no. So, so Brahman, pure consciousness, singular, eternal, absolute, immutable. Through the psychosomatic practices of, of, of Ashtanga Yoga mm -hmm. and purifying the nervous system, cleaning the complexes, getting at the affective core. See, see how you, just take a comfortable seat in the body. I mean, that's one sutra. Now you're beyond the opposites. Mm -hmm. Now you take a comfortable seat in the body. So that the embodiment is part of Patanjali's psychology and philosophy. I don't know that that's true of all Hindu philosophies or practices. I mean, um, Kashmir Shaivism, I would think, yes. Yeah. Um, and and I, I don't know if I've lost the thread here, but the, the, the why it's important is because the affect points to the embodied aspect. Yes. Okay, I want to talk to you about Ashtanga Yoga and the Yamas and Niyamas, but first a question came in from Siguna Mueller in Austria. Um, she asks, you were talking about culture impacting Jung so that his thoughts and insights were only circling around pure consciousness. Can it be that it is not so much about the presence or absence of thoughts or conceptualization, but about their quality? In one case, they are about something, driven and dominating. But there are, all, but there are other thoughts, as if they are only a part, a partial manifestation of something deeper. These types of thoughts are light, exciting, full of energy, and they don't create motion or constriction. Or do you think that every type of conceptualization is taking you away from pure consciousness? Good question. Great question. Um, and no, I don't think. Um, I'll, I'll speak through Patanjali's lens when he talks about um, the Vrittis and he talks about pramana, right knowledge. Mm -hmm. So there are thoughts that are in alignment, you know, thoughts, dharmic thoughts, if you will, um, that are in alignment. So no, I would say... All Vridis make waves. I think that's, mm -hmm. I don't think we can argue that point. Um, but there are Vridis that, or, or thought forms that are in alignment. What we want to be careful not to do is to get stuck in the thought form. Right. So even though they're in alignment, so that, and, and that's what can happen, I feel like, with quote unquote spiritual progress or being on a spiritual path, at every turn the mind wants to co opt it. Mm -hmm. and take ownership of it. And that, to me, would just be the caution with that kind of thought form. You just want to make sure that you're not co-opting it through thought and that it's being brought deeply into the body. Yeah. And actually, you know, there are a lot of scriptures that say, hang out with the right people, put your attention on the right stuff, you know, you know contemplate knowledge, contemplate higher knowledge, don't put your attention on things that are going to that they're going to drag you down. Don't hang out with people that are going to drag you down. So, you know, there's definitely sort of thoughts that are conducive to liberation or, or mental activities or foc foc focus, foci, focuses, foci of attention that are conducive to realization and those which are detrimental to it. Right. And, and I mean, Shankara, right? He pointed to the study of scripture, I believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, the study of the Upanishads to him was 
was a central path or the path. Yeah. Um, and that's thought, you know, reading, reading and digesting those scriptures is a form of thought, but that's pramana, that's pramana, mm -hmm. correct cognition. And that leads us into the yamas and niyamas. I've been, I've been instrumental in helping to form uh, something called the Association of Professional Spiritual Teachers, which uh, has drafted a code of ethics that teachers can perhaps uh, ascribe to if they if they feel comfortable with them, and and to, you know in an attempt to sort of raise the standard of ex expectation of what spirituality looks like and w what kind of behavior. Uh, uh, a spiritual teacher might be expected to display um, because there have been some really crazy things that have been happening. <laughs> and um, in any case, I've been engaged in discussions with people who, some of whom say, this is nonsense, you know, um, spiritual teachers can be full of rage and, and you know, grief and all kinds of, of stuff like that and, and you can't judge their level of consciousness by their behavior. But I think Patanjali, and of course most other traditions, say, well, there are certain behaviors which you should engage in and certain other behaviors you should abstain from if you're serious about spirituality because you need to amass purity uh, because a more pure mind and body are more um, uh, amenable to awakening, to realization. So what are your comments on the niyamas and niyamas and the whole thing about behavior or morality or ethics uh, and spiritual development? It reminds me of the idea of you know crazy wisdom that oh those teachers they're you know they're just full of crazy wisdom yeah which is a literary trope that had no historical basis in fact by the way but anyway go on um, I mean when I hear someone say a spiritual teacher will be filled with rage well I I'm, again this is we're, look anybody can teach from any place and teaching is great and teaching. Um, you know, is the verb, right? We don't want to be a teacher. It's mm -hmm. about the teachings coming through. But the teachings coming through, through an instrument of purity, then the teachings just land in their purest form. I mean, it, uh, I think that's kind of very easy to, to understand. And, and Patanjali, I believe, you know, he puts those jamas, it's the first limb, and, and those limbs aren't... Um, meant to be steps, as Maharishi would say. They, they're like limbs of a body, they all they grow all simultaneously. Grow at the same time. That's what he used uh -huh. to say. Uh, uh, anga means limbs, Ashtanga means eight limbs. Our, right. our, the limbs of our body grow in, in proportion simultaneously. That's right, yeah. and, the, and then we have, the, you know, the Yamas is the first limb, um, non-violence, truth, non-stealing, non-covetousness. You know, the question becomes, where is that rage arising from, um, and why? And, and it, it, to me, it becomes incumbent upon each of us individually. That purification process, uh, it's so finely tuned. I, I'm either doing it or I'm not. Yeah. And if I'm out there being a fraud, um, well, you know, God bless. I don't know how. I, I don't know how it's helpful. Again, to, to me, that's that's somebody getting caught in the teacher archetype yeah. who wants to be a teacher but are they facilitating the teachings and that to me is what's so beautiful about the Upanishads like there's no one's name on them it, 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 it's just teachings that are coming through these seers who see the world this way it's it's beyond any it's the universal yeah coming through a personal but it's beyond any personal form because again it's 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 ultimate absolute reality so um, why would I take ownership of it? So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but my, my question becomes, what is that rage? I would have to know w what that rage w was about. I mean... Yeah, I mean, Jesus kicked the money changers out of the temple, so he had his moods. But, um, you know, he, he wasn't engaging in, you know, inebriated orgies or you know, the kind of things that, that some well-known and even well-respected spiritual teachers have done. And you know, for which for which behavior there's been the rationalization that you know of crazy wisdom or in, that we just can't understand their inscrutably high level of consciousness or something. And I take exception to that, and I'm doing whatever I can in my small way to kind of clarify, help clarify the understanding in contemporary spirituality of what's appropriate and what's not. You know, what what's conducive and what's not to to spiritual development. And I think. Patanjali was onto it, you know, with his attempt to lay down certain 
certain guidelines, you know, not to be moralistic, but to help seekers culture their mind and body to be more fit receptacles of, of spiritual wisdom. Right. So I, I think what you're saying is, look, I don't know that we can have an easy answer across the board. And, and perhaps why in Chapter 4, Patanjali says yogi's behavior is, is beyond black and white, right? Mm -hmm. It's not so easily categorized because, or as Robert Thurman would say, there is a place for righteous anger. Yes. I mean, again, clearly through this conversation, or I think it's clear, I'm coming up against predatory capitalism pretty hard. It rubs me severely mm -hmm. um, it, in a way that I get angry for sure. There's anger, again, as one of those emotional centers, but in a way that I feel is a righteous anger that that fires me to speak towards it. Yeah, I'm not going to lay complacent against it, you know, on my couch and not as a cultural critic go for it and speak to it. If I feel like this body of Earth is being toxified through through that system, yeah, does that make sense? It does. Uh, I don't know if you you chase Sarah Huckabee Sanders out of a restaurant or, <laughs> or something like that, but you know, there's a there's a point to righteous indignation and, and anger and, and, you know, getting a little bit of fire in your belly with regard to these things, not, not being pushovers. Right. Yeah. Right. A um, couple of questions that have come in, and uh, then I have some more stuff I want to talk to you about. Uh, Seamus Broderick from Ireland asks, with regard to self, no self, I was thinking that perhaps it is the language self, word self, linguistic self, that is ultimately unreal. What I mean is that the symbol-formed person, personality, is essentially a fiction, but the body and the pure consciousness are both real. What do you think? I think that's a beautiful way to phrase it. Mm -hmm. um, and it brings up a really interesting point to this dialogue. Jung was um, engaged in a fundamentally conceptual and linguistic form of consciousness, which perhaps we could say most of the West is engaged in. Patanjali acknowledged um, linguistic and you know conceptual consciousness, but he also acknowledges the non-linguistic and the non-conceptual. So I, I think the way that he phrased that is beautiful. Okay, good. Here's another one from Susan in San Diego. She asks, um, can you speak more about, the unif about unifying the opposites and how that specifically happens for you in your direct experience? So unifying the opposites to me is right, left, up, down, in and out any kind of balance, whether that be psychological, physical, mostly psychological and physical, actually. Um, and in my own life, what I've used is the trigger points. Like I brought up my 14-year-old son, my <laughs> beautiful teacher. Yes. Um, so my, in, 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 most of my trigger points have come through personal relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so I watched my reactivity and... Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's 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 radical discernment between am I am I being provoked because the other person is trying to power over me, right? There's there's boundaries, but there's no boundaries. Mm. Everything is ultimately permeable, right? Just like the the air comes into our lungs, like we look like we're bounded, but ultimately we're not, because mm -hmm. we're all breathing in and out of this field. Of, of oxygen, right? It's true. Every breath we take, there's some molecules in there that Jesus breathed. Right. Exactly. So, <laughs> so although we look like we're bounded, we're not. And I want to say the same is true psychologically. There is no, there's a functional organizing principle, no doubt, that allows me to be able to see a wall and not walk into it. Um, but it's it's a very nuanced perception between let's just say, I'm going to keep using my son as an example, between me and my son as he grows up, is he trying to power over me or, you know, where am I in my own power center, in mm -hmm. other words? Um, and I continually used um, personal relationships as a means to be able to stay in my center channel, dialogue, and engage from a place of what I want to call calm equanimity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have to be fierce, but it comes from a place that's really grounded and centered as opposed to reactive and all over the place. Yeah. Okay, good answer. Um, you know, you said that your mission in life is to sort of 
introduce pure consciousness into the popular culture more and to you know make clear to people that that's who they are ultimately and that's the, the fundamental basis of things and I think we've kind of touched upon we sort of have whether consci yeah we have whether consciousness is just a product of the brain or is a fundamental basis of the universe out of which everything arises and I, I think that the whole culture hinges on that question um, and we've talked about that a little bit too now the third chapter of, a f of the four chapter book that we call the Yoga Sutras is all about Siddhis and a lot of times Siddhis are dismissed as being some kind of distraction or, or you know trap and then we should avoid them but if that's the case why did Patanjali devote an entire chapter to them and if Siddhis are real how is it that they could be performed if levitation is possible for instance how could that happen um, and I think it brings us back to this point of whether consciousness is fundamental or a product of the brain. And I could elaborate, but I want you to respond first. Okay, well, first I'll say he, yes, he talks about them quite extensively. It is almost a whole chapter. Um, but at the same time, it's either in that chapter or at the beginning of four. I do think it's in that chapter, though. He also says, but wait a minute, you don't want to get hung up here. Don't want to get hung because, up. But... Because these can also become... Um, conditions of, of which you're sort of wrapped in and and that pure seeing the pure consciousness gets again co-opted through the cities mm -hmm. so so he brings them in but he also makes sure that he he disclaims it in a way yeah um, I think it's really important that he brings them in um, and very interesting again Jung tried to bring them into Western psychology and we still don't have them in a Western psychology I think it's crucial to bring them in because through the vision of yoga, we're talking about universality, what Maharaji maybe would call cosmic consciousness, the cosmic mind. Um, there's no way to really approach that because Western psychology is so built around individualism in the individual mind and co-opting consciousness through the ego. It, it doesn't have space for psychic phenomena because the cosmic mind isn't actually acknowledged. Um, so I think it's it's it, it's brilliant. It's a stroke of genius. It's another element that makes Patanjali's psychology so far superior, so logically consistent, because again he's opening, he's cracking the small nut of the individual mind into the universal, into the cosmic mind. But he's not leaving us without a ground. He talks about the body, and he talks about these powers that come through clairvoyance, clear audience, clear sentience, but it, but also he keeps it real in physical form. So he doesn't leave you spiraling out into the cosmos again into another kind of psychic trip. He 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 takes you there and he grounds you. Yeah. And I and, and I think to, to to me I think it's important. I think it's um, important to acknowledge as a depth psychologist because Jung was trying to do that. He really was, but he didn't mm. succeed in doing it. Again, may not have had the tools. Right. He was trying to do it through his synchronicity hypothesis, pretty much. I mean, psychic phenomena engaged Jung from very early on. His mom was quite psychic. He had a medium cousin. So he was surrounded by it all, all his life. He was surrounded by religion, too. I mean, he had pastors. His dad was a pastor and a lot of uncles. So psychic phenomena and religion were two of the things that really he was seeped in. Um, throughout his life and through um, his study of parapsychology uh, you know eventually he came up um, to his theories of synchronicity and uh, he just never completed yeah. he never completed that. Um, I think there are a lot of things which can happen to you spontaneously um, and you can get hung up in them or not uh, or which you can actually culture, inten culture intentionally and for instance, with the cities, people do experience such things spontaneously. But Patanjali actually gives formulae for culturing them intentionally. You know, if you do sanyama on this, you'll get that. If you do sanyama, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi together on this, you'll get that. So it seems like he was addressing them as a serious thing, which people might actually want to culture intentionally. But again, he, he gave the proviso of not getting hung up on them, because that could easily happen, and they could end up being an impediment to your path rather than some form of integration mm -hmm. or culturing of enlivenment of, of different facets of, of one's entire makeup. Right, right. Um, and, and again, the samyama, you know, the, the concentration, meditation, and absorption, correct me if I'm wrong, but again, that's something, even just those three limbs in themselves 
are absent in Western thought. Oh, yeah. This idea of having something to to concentrate on, meditate on, and absorb into, um, to, so you get a vision from the inside, mm -hmm. right? Instead of a vision from the outside as an object going all around it, right? A real vision sort of prajna. At Patanjali would use the term prajna, which is a sort of non-dual sense of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, it's a feminine term for wisdom and insight, uh, which I believe is... Um, it's more than what we would indicate as intuition. It, it, it's really, it's, it's that non-dual knowing. Um, uh, I think it's kind of related to that point I made earlier about resolute intellect. It's a state of, uh, that, it's a state from which one can function or at which one can reside, from which, you know, when you say something, it, it becomes true. Or if you want to know something, you know it with, with clarity and certainty. Right. Yeah. Right. Which and again, the body, the body has resonance to to truth, and I, I think that's an avenue that needs to be explored more in in Western psychology. And perhaps I'm saying that by opening the door through this affect of neuroscience. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I and again, given. The, the, the world leaders and the people who were allowing to run large countries with a lot of power. I do yeah. believe we really, we really need to understand how the mind works and how the body knows. If, if, if this isn't a time to understand truth with a capital T, I don't know what time on earth would be look like to understand what that means. Yeah, it's critical. I mean, what do you think of the notion that the spiritual epidemic that seems to be spreading around the earth, hopefully it is, is kind of like the, the, the immune system of the planet kicking in, um, and we're like little white blood cells, you know, which are kind of uh, getting stronger in order to kind of gobble up, um, <laughs> you know, and, and change, change the functioning of, of the entire entity that we call Gaia. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great way to look at it. You know, uh, another per way perhaps in would be it's, it's like the activation of Buddha mind. Mm -hmm. Again, it's an imprint, so it gets activated. And um, it's it, we're all completely interdependent. So it's not again, it's not it, it's it's global mind. Yeah, it needs it needs all of us. Mm -hmm. Or at least what, what do you call the hundredth monkey principle? It needs enough of us. Yep. Eat, eat. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, another point I want to discuss with you is, which we've sort of alluded to, but we could sort of take it head on a little bit more, is, um, you know, the relationship between science and spirituality. Like a lot of times you've said in the course of this interview that, well, you know, the West has been deficient in being able to understand the kinds of things that Patanjali was talking about, and even Carl Jung was kind of deficient and didn't really get the, the, the depth of it the way Patanjali and other such Eastern sages did. Um, so I happen to think, uh, and I want you to talk before I go on saying any more, um, that science and spirituality both have something great to offer one another, and um, that they need each other. I mean, they need each other today because there's no going around science. I mean, it's just way too embedded in the culture. Yeah. Um, there's a quote I use, I believe in my book, I know I use it uh, in the chapter I wrote in, in, in Deepak's book on Brain, Mind, Cosmos. Mm -hmm. um, oh, boy. Uh, From you know, where, where, where um, it, it says, you know, in the end, scientists will have to give up the their instrumentation and... and to relax into absolute subjectivity in mm -hmm. order to really know pure consciousness. There's no amount of uh, objectification or representation or othering that will ultimately bring the knowledge that Patanjali points to. And, and to be fair, again, Jung was also pointing to direct experience. Mm -hmm. He got that point for sure. Um, so although science you know, is brilliant at what he, what it does, and I, I don't want to take anything away from neuroscience or, or any of the discoveries there, but this embodied knowledge that we're speaking of will never come through reading a science report. It must come through direct experience. Does that make sense? It does. What if, rather than saying that science will have to give up its instrumentation, 
we could say that science would have will have to expand its concept of of legitimate instruments of, of experiential investigation to include the human nervous system and to use it in a systematic way to explore the kinds of things that Patanjali was talking about. And in, in the same breath we could say that Patanjali was a scientist because he proceeded empirically to um, uh, experience and, and elaborate, uh, you know, articulate these realities. He wasn't hanging on belief. Oh, I, I mean, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I believe I even say that in my book. I guess what I'm trying to say is that direct experience that happens in the person, whether they have nodes on their head because they're in a, a chamber uh, where some neuroscientist is trying to map it, ultimately it falls on the experience of the individual. So if what you're saying is if science will allow in, quote unquote, that qualitative data, mm -hmm. Uh, of people's direct experience, um, sh yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And, and, and in some sense, you know, we have made a slight turn from quantitative to qualitative data. And in the field of consciousness studies, you know, that's where this all sort of gets a bit muddled because there is no way ultimately to fully objectify consciousness. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, B.F. Skinner rejected any sort of subjective experience as being sort of unreliable and, and non-scientific. Um, but everything is ultimately a subjective experience. Uh, you know, any instrument which a, a scientist wants to use, he's using his subjectivity to use that instrument. Um, and the kinds of things Patanjali is talking about, and I, we keep mentioning Patanjali because that's the topic of this interview, but obviously we could replace his name with many different sa saints and sages, um, are subjective experiences, but obviously they're um, real ones, legitimate ones, um, important ones. So, well, go ahead. Oh, well, I think what I hear you saying is, so science, as it stands now, is 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 deeply embedded in our culture, yes. which is a, which ha, which has a dualistic framework. Yes. It's based on a subject object distinction, mm -hmm. and it does not acknowledge that perhaps um, reality ultimately isn't that <laughs> that it, it it really isn't broken down into subject object, but science uses that as its tool. Mm -hmm. A lot of Western philosophers would look at Patanjali and they would look at Orthodox Hindu philosophy and they would say, oh yeah, well, that's a product of culture too. Okay, I hear that argument. But when I read the text and when I live Patanjali's sutras for 15 years, in my opinion, he's below culture. That seeing, it, 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 it's... It's behind the veils of the scene. The, the culture would be in, in the scene. But, Patanjali isn't pointing towards the scene. He's pointing towards the seer. Mm -hmm. So he's not saying necessarily don't have a culture, but he is saying if you have a culture that's in duality, that is divorced from this ground of pure consciousness, you will ultimately have a problem. And that, to me, is exactly what we're seeing. Yeah, for sure. And the problem has gotten worse because the divorce from pure consciousness has perhaps gotten more severe. Um, uh, you, I mean, it's so severe, again, you can't even find it in West, you can't find it in, in the European canon. Yeah. Well, and that, and that points to the, sort of the greater urgency of reestablishing pure consciousness or establishing it for the first pl in the first place as the foundation of everything. Just because you know we've gotten so far out on a limb, or we've built such a high castle without a foundation, that the castle is going to crumble unless we somehow establish that foundation. That's right. That's right. And and and, and you know maybe the castle crumbles first, and then then we gain ground. I don't I don't know. That too. There could, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, maybe, we rebuild maybe whatever is was it was good about the castle, and forget about the rest. That's right. I mean, you know, when you try to build something, you know, on sand, it might all have to come down, and then, then that acknowledgement of okay, we 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 were so split off from nature as she goes, and she's got pure power. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she has pure, pure power. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, you've alluded to that during the interview, and I've mentioned it in other interviews, <clears throat> just that there are so many structures in our society that you can't imagine them just kind of, kind of quietly sort of dismantling themselves and saying, okay, we were wrong, we're going to get rid of this. Uh, there, there might have to be some greater pulling out of the rug from under them in order for them to just collapse and um, no longer be predominant. Right. Yeah. Right. There's a there's there's people very very enamored with their power, with their identification. Again, they've become objects to themselves. They're they're their business card. They're a representation, in other words, right? Yeah. They've 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 stolen consciousness into an egoic, tight container, mm -hmm. and they right. don't want to give that up. They're their name on big tall buildings. Right. <laughs> and water bottles. <laughs> and steaks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and universities. Um, anyway, uh, okay. Well, any stray thoughts in your head right now before I bring in another question? Nope. I think we're good as we are. Okay. So um, a couple weeks ago, I interviewed um, Thomas Hubel, who's a German teacher, and that interview will be going up in, later in December on Bat Yap. And um, he's really big in terms of the, you know, healing the trauma in collective consciousness. He gets together groups of, for instance, Israelis and Germans because he feels like there's this tra traumatic residue left over from World War II that needs to be healed in order for the culture to progress. One question I forgot to ask him, which I'll ask you, is um, what is the nature of collective consciousness such that, such, such that trauma can be stored in it? What is the medium? What is the substance such that something such as trauma can be stored in it? And what is the nature of that that? trauma that's being stored? What, what are these things? Are, are they real things, but very subtle, that can't be observed in any kind of conscious way? Um, or are they just sort of concepts? And I think th this is very young, and this is probably your answer to this question. Uh, well, uh, the storage piece, I mean, for me, I would say it's def trauma is definitely stored in the nervous system, because you, you when 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 there's cathexis, when, when people um, go back and they re-experience that traumatic moment and they're able to release the energy out of that complex um, where it's been stored, then energy can go flow along um, better lines, if you will, clean lines. So the nervous system is able to come back to its still point um, and to its central channel. Below that, um, where would it be stored? I couldn't speculate on anything like that. Well, yeah, sure, it's stored in the nervous system, and there's some speculation that um, you know trauma is handed on in the DNA, and there's been mm -hmm. discussion and studies of that. But you know, Jung spoke of the collective unconscious, and that presumably is a field that's independent of nervous systems, just the way consciousness, pure consciousness, is independent of nervous systems, uh, which nervous systems are nonetheless kind of tapped into or plugged into, and in which they influence, and, and which influences them in turn. So, can you elaborate on that, Annie? Uh, sure. So, well, if we could take the cultural complex of the Cartesian split. Mm -hmm. So, the rife, you know, I think, therefore, I am. The mind-body split. The subject-object split. Um, that's a complex that's very, very rife in Euro-American culture. Um, it gets passed on, for sure, from generation to generation. And yes, I've also read um, the experiments where they they track the trauma through the DNA. It makes complete sense. Um, unless, well, we, we can release it on an individual basis if we acknowledge it. So there's the individual, there's the family, and then there's the culture, right? It's like concentric circles. We're, 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 if we just, for sake of the dialogue, count them as three bodies. You, you can release it on the individual level and, and see through it, but again, you keep coming up against it because you're living in it. <laughs> That's the ocean you're swimming in. Yeah, exactly. And so this comes back to the point that we talked about earlier. Okay, so, you know, people come and they, 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 do, they sit with me or they get on the table or they do their meditation and they do their work, but then they've got to go back out there mm -hmm. and swim in that same cultural complex. Mm. Um, the only way I can see of, of it getting deep attention is, 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 I mean, the culture has, 
people in the ivory tower or in science, people at the higher levels are going to have to see into it in order to depotentiate it at the at the level of culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I was asking a sort of a metaphysical question that is you can only we we can only speculate about the answer. Um, you know, it's just like. For, like water, for instance. I mean, you know, we know what water is, and we know what salt is, sodium chloride. And if we put so salt in water, it dissolves, and the water becomes salty, and it changes, you know, other properties of it, such as buoyancy of objects floated in it. And, you know, we understand that. So what we're saying is that collective consciousness is some kind of a field that can have stuff dissolved in it, you know, the collective unconscious, uh, in the form of trauma. And um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what the chemistry of that is. Um, as, oh, uh, you know, well, okay. What is it about consciousness that um, that can be that it can be a a medium in which stuff can actually get absorbed? Well, it's certainly the twisting of thought form, right? So, so consciousness, it's it's Sutra one point four. So let's we'll go over the first four, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, Atta. Now here we are, an exposition of yoga. Second sutra, yoga is the stilling of the mind. Third sutra, then then pure consciousness abides in its own true nature. Fourth sutra, at other times, consciousness is taking on the modification of the mind form. Mm -hmm. So the mind can appropriate consciousness. It can take it. It can steal it, again, to a degree, and it takes it and it wraps it it wraps it and twists it around these thought forms that are no longer anchored in pure consciousness. And those thought forms, you know, from psyche to psyche to psyche, as people are born through a culture, they, that it, it just becomes part of their own psychology, so to speak. Mm. Okay. Um, would it be fair to say that um, the mind doesn't take over or change consciousness, just as the movie doesn't change the movie screen, but it appears to because it because mental impressions overshadow consciousness. Yeah, pure consciousness is never changing. It's immutable and absolute. That's right. So, so even though right, the mind is appropriating it. That's where this uh, it, it ultimately gets slapped back um, into the field out of which it arose because it doesn't have the ultimate power. Does that make sense? Right? Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah, it, it, it thinks it does, and it, it appropriates it, and it twists and turns and, and, and contorts it. Um, but at some point, the gig is up. Yeah, in your book, you say avidya or ignorance is not the absence of knowledge, but it's obscuration. So, you know, the, the pure knowledge, pure consciousness, whatever, pure self, is never um, destroyed or absent or eliminated, but it gets obscured, overshadowed, lost in, in our entrapment in, in relative experience. Absolutely, and in, in some ways we could say, I mean, God, that's part of the beauty. So in any moment, if, we, if and when we turn our sights to it, it's just there, underpinning and supporting all of this form. So all of the the regeneration and the healing and the wholeness is immediately there to come forward once that acknowledgement is made. Yep, I kind of like to think of this as all we've all won the lottery. We've got a lot of money in our bank accounts. It's just a matter of um, accessing it. But unfortunately, many people are kind of living under bridges because they don't realize they've got that bank account. Yeah, right. And you got to pay taxes. And you got to pay taxes. I mean, says. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just the point that we all have this. There, there's no, uh, as, some, as someone put it, there's no um, energy shortage. There's a, an intelligence shortage, but there really isn't that either, because we we have this vast reservoir of untapped potential just lying in wait for us to tap it. Right. It's just the blockages, right? In in mm -hmm. in, in the fourth chapter, Patanjali says you remove the weeds. Yeah. It, 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 that's what we're just, or the, you know, the clouds move away from the sun that self-illuminating self-knowing you know pure intelligence that, that that's there it just and shining yeah yeah there's a verse in the yoga sutra someplace where patanjali says heyam dukkha managatam which is avert the danger which has not yet come and you know you and i have been talking about the dire predicament that the world seems to be in um 
and uh, I think that might be a good point to end on because you know we can all play a role in changing the course of of destiny. I, I was emailing with a friend who said that you know she's kind of gotten a little pessimistic about whether awakened people or awakening people are actually having any effect whatsoever on the world um, because it doesn't seem like it when you look at the world. Um, so, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, to me, it, it has to do with this idea of the margins versus what's in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And if the margins, if, if um, people with, let's say, knowledge and understanding of pure consciousness are on the margins, if um, those numbers grow, and there becomes greater and greater infiltration or, or pressure on the mainstream, then you know things will change. But if if we can't in, infiltrate the mainstream, then yeah, there would be a problem there. Yeah, I think it was Margaret Mead who said something like, I, I can't even quote it, but I can maybe roughly paraphrase the idea that you know don't don't think that you know some handful of people thinking way outside the box. You know, can't have an effect on on changing the culture. She, she said that's the only thing which ever has. Beautiful, yeah, mm. yeah. But but it, it, right, it's got to get in there. It's got to infiltrate into the culture to change it. Yeah. Not not stay outside of it, right? Not be some fringe. It's got to actually get in there and infiltrate, and penetrate. Yeah. To make the change. Yeah. Okay, I think we should wrap it up. But one more question came in, which is kind of unrelated to what we're just talking about, but I, I want to just ask it because she was kind enough to send it in. Um, this is Fiona from Cedar Park, Texas, asks, how can one bridge the gap between being in the world and out of the world in terms of financial issues, particularly when trying to support loved ones in this unsettling time? I have no doubt that I am that, you know, meaning Brahmin or whatever. However, the lack of money is taking away my freedom. How can you advise? Where should I turn? Right. I, well, I think she's speaking to the conundrum that we we spoke about earlier. At least at the moment, um, the way things are, it's about having that spiritual practice and embodiment, and then also entering into, you know, the workforce because the capital is needed. Um, so we can have a home and so we can put food in our bellies. Um, but with it, at least with acknowledgement, perhaps that, you know, the aim isn't to, uh, feed, you know, the, are you still with me? I'm with you. There was just a little glitch in the video, but go ahead. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's necessary at this time to remain centered and, and have the job so so one can it's the way that we exist in this culture yeah there isn't an alternative at the moment it says in the Gita yoga karma shukoshalam yoga is skill in action so it's not like spirituality and practicality are somehow you know opposed to one another um, spirituality if it's approached in the right way can actually enhance practicality and make you more successful in your job or whatever you need to do yeah, and it's about being present right here, right now. And these are all the Legos that we're all working with. Like, we don't, we can't just sh shuck them off. Like, th this is the way that it is. So it's being present, if you will, Krishna, on the battlefield. I mean, it's it's being present to, to what reality that we have um, and doing our best, yes, to pay our mortgage or, you know, pay our rent um, and finding, if we could just say maybe, because a lot of the clients that I have who are millennials, you know, they want to be working in jobs that are sustainable, that have some sort of eco sensibility. So I think it's the workforce also making choices to look for those companies when and if possible that are doing the work to um, make our environment sustainable. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I mean, you know, somebody could be kind of dragging along in a job that they really don't... Uh, enjoy that doesn't seem to be meaningful but there could be something they could be doing which would um you know um be really light their fire and uh, you know sort of be i mean what i'm doing now i love it but what i was doing for quite a few years it was a way of paying the bills but it had no intrinsic significance to it you know um so you know you can turn the corner at any age and, and perhaps and find something that really 
inspires you. Absolutely, yeah, and works towards the, um, the beneficial aspects of our world. Yeah, yeah, good and point. Then, and then there's not so much of a split between what's inner and outer. You're, you're living, you're using your work a, a, as a means of also so speaking your truth, so to say. Yeah, and I mean, just to take one simple example, um, you know, Trump pandered to the coal miners of West Virginia, like, we're going to dig more coal and you need your coal jobs. What a horrible job. I mean, why not say, hey, let's bring in, you know, manufacture of wind turbines or solar panels or something and really revive the economy in a long-term sustainable way and, it, and you won't get black lung disease and it'll be, you'll get to see the sun. Uh, it, there are all kinds of possibilities if we just uh, have the right approach. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you mentioned your clients. So, what do you have to offer in terms of, you know, you're a therapist, you do that over Skype, um, you know, what, how can people plug into what you're doing if they wish to do so? Yes, I'm, I'm a transformational coach and I uh, work with clients here or on Skype um, and I work yeah, mind-body. So I also um, utilize craniosacral therapy with clients who come to me mm -hmm. um, because, again, it's my understanding for sure that the nervous system is a key component, regulating the nervous system is a key component um, of our spiritual practice, so to speak. Um, so what, what did you say? What is my recommendation? For oh, we're just, or you know, how can people plug in? So I'll link to your website and people yeah. can just see what you have to offer there. And um, I'll also create a link to your book, um, which I found very interesting. People have probably gotten a sense of the flavor of that book from listening to this interview. And... Um, I'm sure there's a contact form on your website where they can get in touch if they want to. Yes, they can, yes. Good. Well, thanks so much, Leanne. I really enjoyed this interview, both uh, preparing for it and doing it. It's, it's really been a lively conversation, I think. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again for inviting me. Sure. Um, and thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, next week, I'll be interviewing Rupert Sheldrake, who is a British scientist who has written about morphogenetic fields among other things um, the idea that um, you know they're sort of you know again the kind of things Leanne and I were discussing about consciousness being a field and, and, and a, a medium through which information can be transmitted um, he even had, wrote a book about how dogs know when their owners are coming home <laughs> so um, that'll be interesting and the week after that is a, a woman who is into shamanism Sandra Inkerman, and then after that I'll be releasing a bunch of interviews I did at the SAND conference. So you can see all those on the upcoming interviews page on batgap.com. So thanks for listening or watching, and thanks again, Leanne. Thank you, Rick. And we'll see you all for the next one. <laughs>